Ето тя е моя доклада. Манада е маноида в категория на фактора. Значи страшно, но в общем то, что есть. Один момент, я буду говорить на английском, потому что готовил этот доклад на английском. Так что с этого момента я переключаюсь на English. So, <coughs> few words about myself. I'm Ike, I'm team lead at TopTal. Uh, he is my contact, so if you want to, you know, you can reach out. And I will try to help you to understand better the category theory. Um, this, is, this is about myself. And going back to the monads. So first of all, who might be interested in this document, in this presentation? Um, if you kind of, you know, if you're a developer, if you work with the software, you on day-to-day -day basis write the stuff that actually based on this shit. It's like the basic of everything that you do. And it's kind of helpful to know better what actually is behind all this stuff. Behind the Ruby code, behind the models, behind the functors, behind the functions you use. And this is the definition of essence of the category theory, which is the base layer of everything. So <clears throat> in order to understand this sentence, it's actually pretty concrete. It explains very well what monads are. Uh, we kind of have to go step by step. We have to understand what monoids are, what category is, what endofunctors are, and what category of endofunctors it presents. And I will try to guide you through this stuff in very short, limited amount of time. And this presentation is for you to be encouraged to learn more about this stuff, to go deeper, to get books on the category theory, and understand the essence of the stuff. And one remark that might be you know, on your mind, it, this is not about functional programming. Functional programming here is just really small part that uses these words. It's much more, it's about the software development in general. So yes, this is it. And we will start this. Yes, we will start from very, very basics. What we have to do is to change the perspective that we have on the way we write functions, the type of the functions, and how we apply the functions. So the top one, uh, like you know, functional length of string to number, is something that you might be familiar with from some languages like Java or C or C sharp, whatever. And the second line is application of that functor of that function on the stringy string. That will actually return the number, which is the length of that string. Anyways, so that top definition is actually okay, -ish, but you want to go with the second one, with the bottom one, because it allows us to get rid of all these parentheses, all this mess that doesn't really help a lot. It just, you know makes it harder to notice what is really important. So yeah, <clears throat> we will use the bottom, bottom one and all over the presentation. As you can see, it's actually almost the same. We have these arrows that describe the return value and this is actually it. So going forward, we will start with the category definition. It's the basic of everything. Um, we can discuss endofunctions without category, we can discuss monoids without category, we can discuss actually anything without category. So, we will discuss the category itself. And the definition of the category is this. Category is a bunch of objects connected with arrows, uh, adding zeros, and composable arrows. Um, this doesn't look really simple, uh, but essence of this, it's kind of will be easier for you to look as functions. So we have five functions here, and you can see that this boolean to boolean function that actually just transfer from true to false, not function, and we already see the arrows, we actually already see the, the objects. So boolean, number, string, all the stuff, all bluish stuff here, actually the objects. And arrows, these arrows, I mean, these orange arrows, exactly the arrows. And if you try to look at this, not as a, you know, as just function types, but as a diagram, it will look like this. And it explains better what, what category is. So we have these dots, string, number, and boolean, and we have the arrows. And uh, you can see these arrows, the orange arrows, they are the same, exactly the same. It's just on the diagram. So this is the essence of the category. 
And identity arrows, you can see, they go from string back to string, from number back to number, from Boolean to back, back to the Boolean. And actually, they are much more than I added to this presentation. So like, we can have more functions that will work on the strings, like lowercase is example, but there might be uppercase, or you know this kind of stuff. But there's functions that go from one to another. And we really don't care about the objects. Objects here are just the places to attach the arrows. What category theory is about is actually about the arrows. So objects here are just to have the starting and ending points for these arrows. And to better understand why we don't care about the objects, we can go here. So you see, inside of the string object, we have the whole variety of strings. The infinite number of strings you can create, you can write, and you know, we don't care about that. We care about the thing about the strings, just string in general. So yeah, <clears throat> this is it. This is the category. There are a few things about category that we have to understand. Oh, this might be interesting. So <clears throat> the category defines one very important thing that you use really a lot. Like it's the essence of what you do uh, when you write applications. You use functions and you use functions together to get new functions, right? So you compose them. This is the composition, and the composition comes from the composition from this diagram. So category theory says, if you have one arrow that goes from one object to another object, from string to number, for example, that length function, and you have function that goes from second object to third object, like from number to boolean is odd, you automatically get the third arrow that, is, that wasn't there. You get this composition of these two arrows that will be the third function. And if you write down this length circle is odd, we will get pretty much this function is odd length that will just apply two functions together to the same argument, the one argument. And you can see that the type definition for this new function is from string to boolean. We just, you know, we omitted the number part. It's, it's not there. We get new arrow from string directly to boolean. And this is the essence of category theory. There, one more thing about categories is that if you apply identity arrows, those arrows that go from string back to string, for example, don't change much, really. <laughs> this is it. So, for example, if you get string and lowercase it, and then try to get the length of the string, Length won't change from the lowercase or uppercase string, right? And this is exactly what uh, the composition of identity rows with other rows means. So for us, to lower length, composition of these two functions is the same as is just function length. And that means you can compose any number of identity functions with any other functions. It's just, it will work out like this. It's just here. And yeah, this is generalization of that stuff I've been talking about. So I've been talking about the category of types. And this is the more general definition on the diagram of the category. Um, I just replaced the, the types that we had, string, number, and boolean with just letters. And, from, and replaced the functions we had with something else. This is called just arrows. Thing is, category of types, the thing that you use, is just one of the parts of the category. Category is much bigger than this. They can be applied to anything. You can have uh, categories not only of, of the functions, but categories of the sets where the morphisms, these arrows, mean something really different. But we don't care about this stuff. We care about types, we care about the programming languages. And in the programming languages, we just have so this is the category. I will make a you know, small break here, just to give you time to get into this. But um, do you have questions for this now, for the category? Is it clear what that means? Huh? Yes? Category is all this schema or just C, B, A? It's part? everything. Okay. It's arrows. Category is about arrows. Ah, okay. It's about structure. Okay. Yeah. Is the error uh, one uh, subscript A? Uh, does it represent 
the entire multitude of identity functions? <laughs> it can be, but or, but, it, or is it just one uh, kind? Yeah, of I just picked one, but there might be much more than this. Um, the second part is endo functors. Um, and this is also not that you know complex. It just has this really shitty name, uh, and it's really like very complex to get what this means from this name. But what it is presents is this: it's a structure preserving transformation from category back to the category. So we've been looking at the objects from you know from one level zoomed up. Uh, we don't, didn't care about the strings inside of the string object, but we care about the string as general thinking, right? So we will go one level higher. And we get the category as object, and the functor is just morphism arrow from that category back to the same category. It's really like that one that with identity arrows, right? It's just the same. But, and you know, to get Better example, we can talk about category of types. And there's really nice endo functor that might be really useful, and it is really useful. It's called maybe endo functor. What it does, um, it transforms the objects and arrows of the category of types uh, to new things. It encapsulates, it's just a box, really. It's a box with one thing. Uh, it box that can hide inside of it the actual value, if it exists, or say there's nothing really in the box, so it's like Schrodinger box, so what's on the types? Um, and it allows us to use the functions that we already have for the strings, for the numbers, for anything else, uh, inside of the box. So it gives us a way to get inside of the box and if there is something inside of the box, if there is value inside of the box, if there is string inside of the box, operate on that string. For example, um, the length function with the co converted with maybe in the functor will check inside of it. Really, it's like this. It will check if there is actually a value string, and if there is, then it will apply the function that we get, like, uh, that we put here. And if there is nothing, it will just return nothing. Very simple. And this is the essence of endo functors. So box for any kind of types we have, and function, uh, a way to get our functions that we know inside of the box and do calculations or apply them. In general, just apply them. This is about endo functors. But what endo functors do, they extend the types category. They don't change it, they don't create new category, they just extend. So. This arrow, big arrow, is application of maybe and the functor on that category type of types we had here, really, uh, and we get the representation of that stuff on the bottom, and the whole thing is now a category of types. It's just extended with the uh, with and the functor maybe. Yes. So now we have this big picture of category of types, and we get new objects and new arrows that converted by the maybe in the factor. They operate on the new part. And you may now wonder, hmm, why, would, why we don't have arrows that go from old objects to new objects, right? And this is actually possible. We can create any kind of function that will operate on this. I just didn't draw them. I was a bit lazy, but yes, there are functions that will go from string to maybe string or maybe number. We'll stop there for endo functors and go to the monoid part. Um, do you have questions on endo functors? Is it clear what it means? Yeah. No. No? <laughs> so natural is just like no? Or what? Or undefined? <laughs> Whatever you prefer, it's just nothing. It's, it's nothing. Really, you can represent it in any way you want in particular programming language, but what we care about is that there is no value, right? Okay. So it's about how we apply the function inside of the box. You can do, like, if something equals null or something equals undefined, mm -hmm. and then call the function if it does not. But it's technical details. Okay. And we don't care about technical details. It's like, not important. OK, going to monoids. Actually, I'm going very you know, fast. But OK, let's go to monoids. This thing you use, it's like, uh, it's everywhere, really. 
from numbers from to strings to everything. Its definition is also very simple. Well, for me at least. <laughs> <coughs> so, monoid is a set of elements with a unit element and a binary operation for combined elements. Okay, now I realize it's not that simple, but anyways, it's simple. Believe me, you will see it. <coughs> I can reshape that definition to this. And I will stop on this slide for a bit. Yeah, I get it. So, imagine we have set S. With elements A, B, C, and unit element E, binary operation orange dot on this S. And all this stuff together is monoid if they have, uh, if they satisfy these two laws. So, first one is called associative law. A binary operation applied to A, B first, and then to result of A, B with the C should be the same as binary operation applied to B, C first, then A, B is that result. It's simple. Uh, with the unit, uh, it's that no matter how you combine unit element with other elements of the set, you will get that ele other element of the set. So A with unit is the same as A, unit with A is the same as A. This is it. If you, if you try to look at this as just functions, dot is a function, maybe there's some language where you can, you know, write dot as a function, but anyways, imagine there is a such language. Uh, we will get that style definition for <coughs> the dot operation, binary operation, as S multiplied by S. Yeah, these binary operations usually called multiplication of elements of the set. So S multiplied by uh, this S gives us back S because we operate on the elements of the set, so it doesn't change. And unit is just an element to S. It's always one, always this thing. Okay, now we have to get to example to understand this, right? I like this example. So, <coughs> strings, actually string with concatenation as a binary operation is a monoid. And unit element will be the empty string. So if you concatenate Ruby with empty string, you get Ruby. No matter how you concatenate it, right? From left to right, doesn't matter. You will always get this back the same stuff. And if you concatenate strings, group the concatenation together in one way or another way, you will get the same stuff. So bunny loves first and then carrot is the same as loves carrot and then bunny. It will be the same stuff. And this is what you do. There's actually monoids that you know probably better. Um, numbers with numbers with zero and with addition is monoid. Numbers with multiplication and one number is also monoid. And there's really a lot of stuff that will be a monoid. But this is the essence of the monoids. I will stop here. Is it clear what monoids is? Sure, but by definition, uh, the operation is not uh, commutative, right? Yes, we don't care about this. We just say, okay, it might be, it might not be, but it's not important for our part, right? I'm really omitting a lot of stuff that is really technical for math guys, uh, that is not really important for us as software engineers. So, <clears throat> if you try to combine these three definitions, we will go to the to this. <clears throat> okay. So as, again, <clears throat> we have category of types, and we have the arrows that go from category of types back to the category of types. And this stuff is actually also a category. It is category of endofactors. You may not see it from this point, but from this point, it's actually very visible. So. Each dot here is one end of factor, and we have arrows that go between end of factors. So you get a density end of factor. As you can see, it doesn't do anything. It just returns the value that it has inside. It's just very simple. It's a box with all, that always has the stuff inside of it. You can think of it like that. And application of the function inside of this box will always be the same as without that box, right? So this is it. Uh, we have a list and the functor, which is like array, 
which is array actually. Yeah, and now I think it, yeah, it is array. So if you apply a list in the functor on strings, it will get a row of strings. And if you try to get length of the string inside of the list, you get into trouble. Because you don't know which element to get from the list and if there are elements in the list. And to get to resolve that problem, we have to operate on the category of end of functors a bit better, and we have to connect other end of functors. So since we have maybe end of functor that we already know, we can use it. Imagine that in the array of strings, there is no element. Then we can say that maybe end of functor will return nothing, and then have this nice head function that will look inside of the array, see if there's elements in the list, and if there are, then get that first element, and then on that first element we can do like, I explained it very poorly, but. So we get the first element, and we apply the length of that first element. So this is the length of the string with the list um, and the functor. And we had to define the new function that will use already well-known maybe end functor to get new stuff. And this together will form this new thingy. So we had now, we have transformation from one end functor to another end functor. We got from list string to maybe number. And this actually call, call has really good naming for, for this stuff. It's called natural transformations. And we don't care about this stuff, we just care that there might be functions between different end of functors. And there are really a lot of functions between different end of functors that we can use to combine the stuff and get all these things. So this is the essence of the category of end of functors. You know, in that definition we had the category of end of functors. Manoids in the category of end of functors. So this is the category of end of factors. Going forward, <laughs> monoid in the category of end of factors. What does that mean, right? Uh, <laughs> this is it. This is the meaning of, of monoid in the category of end of factors. Um, monoid has definition of these two things, binary operation and unit. This is the definition of the functions of these operations from the type. This is the, the types. So to get the monoid inside of the category of other functors, we somehow have to inject something that will have these types inside of the category of other functors. These arrows between other functors. How we can do that? Well, we can create new functions. So to get the first binary, let's name it join. Uh, some of you who have experience with Haskell may already see these names very, you know, very, they might be very familiar to you. But, and, you know, this is kind of the way Haskell works. But we don't care about Haskell for now. So, look, we had list, oh no. We had list of lists, and this is the array of arrays, right? And if we have function that will take list of lists, it will be S and S, right? S in square, you may think of it. And that will return just list of strings, not double list of strings. Then we will get this definition. This is, this is what we will get. So if you define something like join, that will do this, we will get it. And it's really easy to define, right? I mean, you just take array and get the first element out of the array, and this is it. You get this join for your race, for the list. Second part is a bit trickier. So to get the element, unit element of the category of end of functors, we just have to wrap any value to something. For the list, it will mean that we will get a singleton list. We will just get the value and put inside of the array. Okay, I will make a break here. Do you get it? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you can continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I enjoyed this talk, but you know, the idea is that you get the some 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 learning still. Um, join will just take two inner functors, 
or n the functor in square, if you mu multiply one to yeah, one, yeah. you will get one in square, right? So I will get this squared string in the list and get just string list. And join does that. Yeah, but we had, imagine this is the square list, right? Because we have two lists inside of each one. And there might be x here, right? So return is a function or what? Return is function, right. It's just, it takes element from types and puts inside of some, uh, some end of functor. For, for our case, it's just a list. And this is the unit element, unit function for us. And this is the binary operation function, join. They might be defined not only for list, and they are defined not only for list, but for oh, different end of functors too. So for example, the return for maybe end of functor will, be, will just in box it and say, okay, there is value inside of the box for me, right? This is it. Or maybe, maybe, we'll just spot it. So here you use the list uh, more than just an example, as an example. Right. So it's, it's uh, for different monads, uh, for different uh, monads it will be just different. Uh, Don't use monads, for Don't confuse people. But yes, uh, join and return for different ender functors will be a bit different because these box have different shape inside of them. And they, sh you know, the operation to box different things will work differently. For strings, you put inside of the uh, empty list one element and it will be just boxing for the string that will be just returned for, for the list. For maybe you will just put just, you know, the type we had. Uh, inside of the maybe box, maybe end of functor. And for other end of functors, it's the same. For ID, it will be just ID. It will remain the same. You maybe probably already kind of, you know, get the understanding that what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to pull out is to put these two functions inside of the category of end of functors. And if you do that, we get monoids, and the category of end of functors. So join return from the monoids at binary operation and unit operation from the monoids plus the box part of the end of functors and the ability to apply function inside of the box is monad. This is it. This is the monad. <laughs> no, 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 wait, wait. What? Let me go over it. So, monads really just monads in the category of end of functors. You add two functions to the end of functors that operate on the boxing part, and you get the monads. This is the essence of the stuff. You have questions, guys? Just one question. For instance, in Так ты их уже используешь, это вся штука. Ты используешь списки, ты используешь массивы. Честно. Не время. Если ты используешь, ты уже используешь факторы. Если ты делаешь for each or each or, uh, на списках, ты уже делаешь unboxing этого списка. Ты уже работаешь с факторами, как, как с факторами. На самом деле, ты ходишь по элементам, и за, твоя функция заходит внутрь этой коробочки и делает над элементами штуки всякие. И это, в общем-то, и есть фактор. Monoid, monoid part это чуть-чуть сложнее. Yeah, есть? Да. С монадами, если ты получаешь список элементов, и пытаешься получить первый, спис... первый элемент из списка, если его там нет, или если там он есть, это есть монада. 
Потому что тебе приходится брать этот самый элемент. Ты уже делаешь монаидическую операцию. Я взял первый элемент из списка, а список пустой. И мне вернула эта операция Нил. Я могу дальше делать какую-то операцию над Нил, возвращать еще один монаид. Тебе придется делать небольшие воркераунды, но эти воркераунды... Да, но эти воркераунды, это, в общем-то, и есть то, что типа дает тебе вот эту коробочку няшную. А по сути это ничего не меняется. Это уже и так оно и есть. Вот. Скала хороша. В скале проблема есть одна. Там факторы не определены. Э, там мона, монады не определены через факторы. Там монады и факторы это две разные сущности. Хотя, на самом деле, как мы видели, там нужно добавить в факторы две штуки всего, два метода, и ты получишь уже, уже монады. Почему вообще доклады не группируются по наркоманской стене? Чтобы отстреляться и все. Ну, в любом случае, спасибо. Другие вопросы? Все все поняли? Прекрасно. Да. Вот про списки, работать со списками, понятно, даже в теории там, функционального программирования, то есть там, э, то есть, там у них есть, есть функциональное программирование, как бы, это плохой тон брать и по массиву проходить как бы, циклом, который чем да, если у тебя должен быть какой-то там map, э, reduce, pitch, это понятно. А вот какие еще вот, примеры? Хороший пример, который все любят, который все на самом деле делают. State машины. Любая state машина это на самом деле монада. Потому что в state машине, в любой части state машины, тебе приходится проверять, что тебе можно пойти дальше. В, любом, в каком-либо виде ты это делаешь. И эта state машина, можно ее придумать как про state монаду, можно про нее думать как монаду maybe. А, с комбинацией как стоит монады. Потому что тебе приходится проверять, есть ли у тебя что-то на этом шаге, могу ли я пойти дальше. Вот эта проверка, это и есть, в общем-то, то, что тебе просто делать с nothing value в этом в монаде. В монаде maybe. Это типа то, что типа хорошо используется везде и всюду. Другой хороший пример, который... Есть у тебя бизнес action в приложении. Рубишное приложение, хорошее какое-нибудь, прекрасное рубишное приложение. И с твоим бизнес action тебе нужно учитывать, что типа, есть ли, есть ли это вообще объект, на котором ты пытаешься типа, это сделать. А вот эти проверки, явные или неявные, это сводится, по сути, тоже к этому, к, к раду. Это просто есть большая проблема, я считаю, с тем, как обучают людей э, функциональным программированием или вообще показывают это, как, как совершенно отдельную сущность, Хотя, по сути, это не, ничего другого там нет. Это просто, типа, немного другой подход писать. Ты вместо того, чтобы писать, например, if something, something else, ты просто это делаешь чуть-чуть иначе. Ты просто запихиваешь в функции, и пусть она сама там дальше разбирается. Но на самом деле, в любом программировании, функциональном, оперативном, ты делаешь то же самое. На рисунке, где многие ну, граф э, с типами, э, там получается, да, идет зацикливание, и каждый тип вот, переходит только в одну сторону. Бывает ли такое, что вот с Мэйби переходит в ID? Да. И что это будет? Это будет ничего, ничего не будет меняться. ID, эндофактор ID, вот эта вот штучка, это просто бокс, в котором типа есть валю всегда. Типа, это бокс, который типа виртуальный по которому мы не паримся. Он просто есть как сущность. Просто с ним удобно делать всякие классные операции. Его легче, легче использовать, когда ты пытаешься делать эти функции между двумя эндофакторами. Вот эти вот функции, с ними легче работать, когда ты все смеешь как эндофакторы. Они типа, вот это здесь эндофактор, а здесь это просто значение. То есть, типа, если ты думаешь, что везде коробки, то ты можешь делать со всеми коробками одно и то же. Хотя там, в некоторых местах коробка нафиг не нужна. Да. А, я не, не то что вопрос, но вот Ирелу Live Forum в рубишной системе тоже есть. Генчик, Драйвер Би, Комьюнити есть, Драйвер Монац. Реально прикольно, оно просто позволяет убрать кучу ифов, и ты можешь обернуть да, там и работать с ним более-менее э, 
до всяких этих флоу, nested if и прочее. У тебя есть просто монад, ты вернул right -right. Это просто другой способ написать одно и то же, реально. Потому что то, что в функциональном языке добавляют, то, чего нет в императивных, типа реально кличи, где происходит, это то, что они тебя жестко бьют по рукам, если ты не работаешь с, допустим, с maybe полностью. То есть, если ты пытаешься из maybe коробочки достать значение, которое там может быть, то тебя функциональные языки бьют по рукам, говорят, типа, чувак, давай ты будешь делать как надо, давай ты проверишь, что там что-то есть. Вот это вот, типа, обязательно делать эту проверку. Вот то, что функциональные языки добавляют. В Ruby, как в динамическом языке, этого нет. Поэтому, даже используя монады, ты можешь спокойно сделать, просто взять, попытаться достать файлы, значения оттуда, которого там может не быть. Поэтому вся эта идея про то, чтобы в Ruby использовать чистые монады, типа там делать классы, Dry Ruby — это прекрасная штука, это не имеет значения, потому что на выходе тебе никто не заставляет делать это хорошо. Тебе никто не заставляет делать все проверки. Если ты сводишься к тому, что у тебя в любом случае есть ошибки в рантайме, это просто про удобство, не больше. А в Скала, допустим, тебе не позволит без этого обойтись. Типа, тебе заставят это сделать. Что круто? Да. Это позволяет получить гарантии, что, типа, зачинив множество операций над множеством и коробок, на выходе у тебя будет что-то стоящее, а не сломанное приложение, которое упало с exception. А в Ruby такой гарантии у тебя нет. Ты не можешь, типа, быть уверенным, что так произойдет. Что, типа, ты везде все учел. Ты имеешь в виду exception, например, когда ты пытаешься распаковать? Ну да. Ну, вот, я просто... У нас приложение используется такой гимчик, называется Trailblazer Operation. По сути, результат заворачивается в right-left монаду, и у него поверх того есть success и failure method. Когда ты хочешь работать с этим... Э, Объектом ты просто должен проверить success, failure, могу я с ним дальше, и все. То есть, да, надо но теперь кто-то заставит это сделать, да, потому что не заставит. Но, в принципе, если ты сделаешь этот проект, у тебя не будет runtime exception. Вот, в этом вся штука. Просто типа, нужно сделать так, чтобы на код-ревью, вот прекрасно была предыдущая презентация, чтобы на код-ревью кто-нибудь проверил во всех местах, что есть это. А тут тебе компилятор сам все сделает, тебе и скажет, чувак, все хорошо. И в этом все отличие от этих строго типизированных функциональных языков от всех остальных. То, что делает их лучше, в кавычках. Да. А в JavaScript промис это монада? Да. Он на полностью монада всем требованиям. Да, она монада, просто типа функции, которые там нужны, называются немного иначе. Там вместо у нас этого самого бинда и джойнов, у нас просто там типа дэн, все такое. Но по сути это не меняется. То же самое коробочка. Ну, самом деле, вот, просто... какой-нибудь э, функциональный программист, это же ну, бомба за медленного действия. Вот он написал на скале, там, шейк, на какой-нибудь, скал Z, и ушел. Приходит человек, это же, ну, идиотизм реальный. Это, там, это скала. Там, то, что хорошо в Ruby, тебе не дают объявить новых операторов. Скала тебе поощряет объявить новых операторов. И это в этом типа отличие, которое на самом деле ведет к большим сложностям. Спасибо. Спасибо.